It's spoiler in time, folks. And boy, are we spoiled by the amount of television there is out there. This is the show where we take all that hard work on Cord Killers trying to figure out what to watch and then watch it and talk about it. This week, we're talking about The Larry Sanders Show, episodes 9 and 10 of season 1, Mr. Robot, episodes 6 and 7 of season 4, Watchmen, season 1, episodes 4 and 5, The Good Place, season 4, 7 and 8, The Mandalorian premiere, episodes 1 and 2, Rick and Morty's back for season 4, episodes episodes one and two. I'm Tom Merritt, episodes one and two, and he's Brian Brushwood, episodes three and four. <laughs> hey man, but more importantly, we just got to get real quick caught up. We got a big episode, so let's keep it fast as we check in on the movie draft. Still number one. Still number one, Tom. How's it feel? Worldwide biggest gross R-rated movie ever. Is not what I expected when I bought Joker. Very thrilled. Uh, it helps make up for the stinging disappointment of Doctor Sleep's eighteen point eight million dollars, which is a bummer uh, because I heard it's good. I heard Doctor Sleep yeah. is good. And uh, Ford versus Fry, we don't have the numbers in here, but apparently it did like twenty plus million. So that's that's bringing me back on target. Uh, I I've, I've not talked enough about how much I enjoyed calling my shot with the Lion King last year and then winning the summer movie draft. I really wish I could do that this year. No, but man, you did, you, this none is, of us expected. This is none of us not dared that situation. Hope. Yeah, man. And, and, uh, I, I, uh, deserve it. Like, like 41 for Joker. That seemed insane. And yet smartest play of, of the game so far. Though I think technically yeah. Adam's family has a better price per, per, per dollar spent. Because it, was, it wasn't as much spent on right. it, right? Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, but... Well, uh, I really do think it's coming down to Star Wars, right? Is that yeah. the conventional yeah, that's wisdom? your only competition, is Star Wars. And, weirdly enough, I wonder if The Mandalorian is going to kind of eat a little bit of uh, the final Star Wars' lunch. It could go either way, right? It could push people to be more excited, or it could take a take a little air out of the balloon. I could I could see that working either way. You're right. So so Andrew Main sent over a meme of you know the uh, the guy turning to look at the other girl meme. Uh, it was that except it's the Mandalorian and Ray is all mad. Is <laughs> the angry girlfriend? And I was like, two I've seen a on ton the of nose. those. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, this weekend, it's uh, Jenny Josephson and John Teasdale. Uh, Jenny's got 21 Bridges and A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood coming out. I think A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood would do well for her. Uh, and then, of course, John has a, a sequel called Frozen 2. That I think that'll do pretty well for John. <laughs> yeah, man. That is your only competition, is, is whether they can come back with a vengeance. Yeah, the problem with John is he's got Frozen 2, but he also only has Maleficent and Jexy. Uh, Playmobil the movie, I don't know if that makes up the difference. So oh, he's at $107 me, million right now. He's only got two left. That's far from the only problem with John. But we don't have time to go into all that. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't want to say. I think he's a fine man, and we would not impute his character in the movie draft. But we will impute it in other arenas. Trust us. All right, let's move on to talk about... Rick and Morty, uh, how do, uh, first impressions. How, how are you feeling about the new season of Rick and Morty? I got to be honest. That very first episode, I watched the first three minutes, and every character was acting exactly how you would expect every character to act. And there was a brief moment that I was horrified to think, wait, am I over Rick and Morty? And then it got interesting. And then it got more interesting. Mm -hmm. And then it got freaking phenomenal. And then by the time it was over, it was exhausted, and I felt like I'd seen a two-hour movie. Uh, th that first episode was brilliant. The second one I watched this morning, kind of thought it was just a bunch of cheap gags and kind of a hot mess. I didn't really like it, but I'm in the minority. Bryce, you you dug that one, right? Yeah, I thought it was I thought it was good. I had actually rewatched season three uh, just to kind of get back in the mood, and it felt like getting right back on track. I think I think part of it is because there was not a big like story beat like there was between season two and season three. And yeah. so it had that meta commentary in episode one of just like, we're going to do uh, normal adventures, but also like crazy experimental adventures. It was kind of like a reset now that they've got that big deal, that big Rick and Morty, like a hundred episodes. They got deal. a lot of runway. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I actually had a moment where I felt the same, uh, Brian. I think my moment came in episode two, if I'm remembering right, where I laughed and realized it was the first time I'd laughed at the episode. And I'm like, oh, no. Is that, are the episodes not funny? Uh, but I look back and I think of things like, you know, sliding through and becoming a, a, a 
crustacean version uh, of Rick. Uh, I, I I think of the uh, the intern. Don't don't launch an app. Uh, and the there's a lot of the humor that that sinks in and works better the longer you think about it, uh, which is classic Rick and Morty. So while you're right, I don't know that there's there's anything here. I get, I mean, you really liked episode one more than I did. I I kind of feel like these are both really really good Rick and Morty episodes, and I'm I'm happy to be back, and I'm looking forward to the next one. Agreed. All right, let's talk about The Mandalorian, episodes one and two. Uh, Brian, how do you feel about The Mandalorian? Man, I'm going to try to keep this as short as we can, so I'm going to have to talk real fast. Look, remember when Star Wars was good? Remember when uh, 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 you acknowledged that it was a silly, crazy uh, mishmash of different 20th century tropes, but you didn't care because they respected you with their pacing, with their amazing execution? It's like listening to Jimi Hendrix play the Star Spangled Banner. That's a very, very simple tune, but when you hear it melting faces in, this, in the hands of skilled professionals, it's incredible, and that's what it's like watching The Mandalorian. Yes, the the dialogue is so cheesy, hackney garbage. Um, uh, the uh, the tropes, every trope you can think of is in there. Every set piece, the moment you see him thrown off of a beast he's learning to ride, you're like, oh, he's going to do the thing where he walks up and puts his hand on there. Yes, all of that is in there. All of it. Awesome. All of it. So awesome. And even better than what it does is what it doesn't do. It refuses to acknowledge anything that happened before. Freaking giant creature gets lifted off the ground. Clearly a demonstration of the force. They don't do the cheap thing that you would expect where they say, what's that? Oh, I don't know. In another part of the galaxy, I heard of something called the force. They don't do that. They say, why did that thing float? They're like, I don't know. Let's keep going. Then they're, <laughs> they, and it earns its cuteness. If you told me that this movie was, that this show was going to have a baby Yoda in it, I would say, I would flip over the table and say, I'm done with you. This is it. This is the most naked cash grab. I'm out, I'm out, I'm out. But instead, through its cruelty, through its brutality, through its continuously surprising me by doing daring things, I believe that this is a dangerous, scary universe. And as a result, it earns the right to have overtly the most obscenely cute object in the entire Star Wars universe, and I don't even care. I'm 100% in. I can't believe it. I loved it. And I love the score. Somebody's rolling their eyes at the score. I never thought I would hear an electric guitar riff in a Star Wars score and love it. I, I dug it. I, I, I think I want to direct people to listen to Let's Talk About Star Wars because uh, our, my co-host on there, Jenny Josephson, aforementioned Jenny Josephson, uh, had a much different take on The Mandalorian. It's not necessarily a negative take, but if you've heard Brian not love a thing you loved, uh, you'll recognize Jenny talking about The Mandalorian. And I think that's so interesting to me because I'm with you. I watched this and I thought, oh my God, this is great. This is a Western. It's a spaghetti Western. John Favreau is saying, well, what if we had a guy in Mandalorian armor and he doesn't have to be Boba Fett. He's just a guy in Mandalorian armor and he is uh, the good, bad, and the ugly. Uh, he is the mysterious stranger. He is the guns of Navarone. He is just walking He's through an empty wilderness uh, with only one thing on his mind, finishing the job, which involves killing. Uh, and I love that kind of story. And this is so well executed. If you don't like that kind of story, though, it's still good, but it loses you in a lot of things to the point where there's nostalgia items in here that I think hilariously are bothering people who loved Force Awakens because Force Awakens had a different kind of nostalgia. So I don't know. I just wanted to give space to that idea because personally, I've just found this to be amazing uh, and and beat for beat everything I want to see from this kind of live action, from the first live action Star Wars television series, even though nothing happens in the first episode. For the most part, nothing happens. So little happens. And yet it's constantly moving. It's constantly taking you from one place to the next so that I never got bored. I loved it. Yeah. The uh, Also, I got some hints of, and I, I suspect this is not entirely a coincidence, I'm getting some strong Roland of Gilead vibes, some Dark Tower in there oh, because yeah. where no, his absolutely. reputation precedes him, he's like, oh, if, I, if the legends I hear about you are true, you'll have no trouble. And he's assembling a very bizarre quartet. Um, I, I feel like, and, and he insists that he doesn't need help, but clearly he keeps needing help. I mean, it's kind of the story of, I think we're going to see a similar Roland of Gilead arc. I think we're going to find out why well, he's so wounded. The gunslinger was taking 
from spaghetti westerns and from classic westerns and remixing it and saying, oh, well, let me let me give you kind of a magical fantasy version of that. And a Mandalorian is just in that tradition. It's like, all right, let me take good spaghetti westerns and western traditions and what Stephen King did. And now let me put that in a Star Wars package for you. It's brilliant. Uh, never thought I'd say this, but holy cow. Is Nick Nolte a fantastic treasure? <laughs> he, he was a uh, uh, he he was the 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 ugnot who was saying uh, I I have spoken. Uh, he was great. Yeah, I, I, mostly because you have no idea it's Nick Nolte unless you know it's Nick Nolte. Or if I, you're I paying only found close out you kind of tell. But it, like if you weren't expecting Nick Nolte, there's nothing obviously Nick Nolte about him. Yeah, um, highly highly recommended. Possibly my favorite Star Wars anything. Oh, uh, in another moment that uh, there's a moment at the end of episode two where he gets his ship back up and he's about to go off. And and I just felt this vague like, oh, here it comes. Here comes the star line and the hyperspace jump. They don't do it. They don't do it. Every moment you suspect you know where this is headed, they refuse to let you go there. Yeah, I found it uh, uh, pretty good at, at subverting my expectations. Or if it did go somewhere, uh, I was expecting it was something that I would have been disappointed if they didn't. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's that, it's that kind of thing. Uh, it's a fistful of Yodas. Uh, I, do you I, have any, I, I also, uh, I went in not even knowing that this was set after return of the Jedi. So to mm. me, this is sort of the first for foray into the star Wars expanded universe. As I remember reading those books, it's, it's truly uncharted territory. Um, yeah, highly recommended. It's, it's one of the nice things, too, is uh, John Favreau made the decision not to label things. So we don't really know what planets he's on. Maybe he is on Tatooine. But if he is, it doesn't effing matter because we're not bothering to tell you what matters is what he's doing there, who he's talking to, and what his quest is. Yep. Uh, and 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 even names uh, of people. Uh, you know, we don't know the name of the Mandalorian for goodness sake. He's or, just Mando. Yeah, they just call it. They just call it uh, the child as well. Oh, they also do. Um, you know, there there's been this obsession, this completionist obsession in Star Wars that I'm glad they set aside. Like they would do an entire half hour of like, did you ever wonder where that lapel pin came on the side of this one Imperial officer? Well, here's a whole half hour about it. Uh, instead, it's just like there's so many things. Like he walks, he he doesn't have uh, any kind of gizmo on his helmet when he walks into the cave he walks into the cave suddenly there's a flashlight on there you don't know how it got there doesn't matter don't waste my time just keep going and i mm -hmm. I, 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 I love it yeah the, uh, and there's opposite examples that are similar to that uh for instance when he's got the child and he jumps on the back of the sand crawler i immediately thought like oh well what's going to happen to the child he's going to have to go back and get him uh and they could have done that they they could have just hand waved that and had the whole fight scene. And when it was done, he walks over and the child's there and you just leave it to your imagination. Like, oh, I guess the child followed. But no, they took the opportunity to show you the baby whizzing at 80 miles an hour following along uh, with the sand crawler, which I thought was fun. I enjoyed that. Uh, I also liked that was the first time that we saw the sound sand crawler. I, I like the way you called it, uh, you know, a crawling fortress. Like I would mm -hmm. never have thought of it in those terms, but they gave a justification to that ridiculous shape. That uh, that made it a fun kind of uh, medieval siege moment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm just can't say enough good things about did, the Mandalorian. Did you catch and I'm there was very one to meet the, there was one moment in the second episode when they're going through the valley and you could tell an ambush is coming, but there's this moment that a shadow goes, and if you look at the moment after it, he's looking up and turning over. If you look at and in the shot right now, uh, I'm I'm sketching out this much of his helmet, uh, about three inches of strip across my, my forehead, you can actually see the reflections of people running and jumping across the top on there. Did, did you happen hmm. to see that? No, I didn't notice that. Yeah. It's like the attention to deal detail is extraordinary. Yeah, this is uh, this is good. And, and I'm, I'm very curious, uh, if this is Yoda and Yaddle's baby or, uh, what I hope to be true, just a brand new, whatever that species is called, I hope so. uh, that's 50 years old and, and shows that that species existed somewhere else. And we just never knew about it. And I that's trust fine. Them. And they're force sensitive. I trust them to do the right thing here and just, just let it be somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about Watchmen episodes four and five. Uh, 
mostly just moving the story along in the investigation uh, until yesterday's episode, episode five, where we revealed uh, that everybody is in on it, basically, except for the FBI agent, I guess. Uh, yeah, wait, wait, everybody's in on. So, what? so the Senator is actually running the Rorschach community and the church isn't real. It was in a studio set. Uh, and the chief of police knew about this and he was running the police in uh, congruence with the Senator to kind of keep everything under control. So here, here's uh, my new favorite podcast is listening to Justin Robert Young melt down every time we discuss this show, because he very much values the source material. he, I uh, reread the entire thing in anticipation of this, and uh, it's agonizing to him. He feels like the way they portray uh, uh, Veidt, uh is is comical. They make him dumb, and instead, this is a mastermind. This is Alexander the Great conquering the entire world, and you're making him look like a buffoon. Uh, I don't feel that way. I feel like they're doing a version of the broken genius. Like It reminds me a bit of the character that Jemaine Clement played in Legion, where uh, it's just a little bit touched, uh, a little bit comical, um, but I adore all the Vite stuff. I got a real thrill when they flung his body out, and we figured out exactly where his prison was. Uh, I, I guess it looks it looks like it's Europa from from what you could tell, but it's Except definitely or, one of yeah, the Galilean moon moons. Of Jupiter. Yeah, but uh, but I love that they are they they set up questions are better than answers. And boy, oh boy, did they set up a lot of questions in, in, in episode one, and they are slowly feeding us enough answers each episode to keep us on an IV drip. I would say the stronger of the two, I rather liked the whole backstory of Looking Glass. That was great because it felt like a standalone adventure with a new character. Um, I, I, I'm really digging it. Uh, I think Justin would dig it in an alternate universe where he has not read The Watchmen. <laughs> but uh, uh, but I don't know what it's like to go into this not being familiar remotely with this universe. I don't know how crazy everything seems. Yeah, I mean, I read the, I've read the book and I enjoyed the movie and I uh, understood uh, most of the changes they made except for the giant squid. So from that perspective, and granted, my fandom of Watchmen is not even a tenth of Justin's, uh, I saw the backstory of Looking Glass to be a validation uh, to say, hey, folks who hated the fact that they changed the squid in the movie, here it is in all its glory. We've given it to you. Uh, and I, I love that. I was like, good, finally, yes, this is how the other, this is how the movie should have ended. There was no reason they had to change it uh, unless there was an effects budget issue. But here, this HBO TV show was able to do it. So there you go. Uh, I love that. I thought it was great. And yeah, I, I'm with you. I don't see Ozymandias as being comical or dumb. I see him as being desperate uh, and sort of, like you say, kind of the mad genius who's who's starting to lose it in isolation. And now we know why, uh, because he's been on Jupiter and he's been clever enough to be able to break out of his prison and cause what I'm guessing is some kind of automated security protocol robot to come after him. No, Although I think, I think he just used, human. he used those bodies to basically spell out an SOS, knowing that there were various satellites that would be getting updated imagery. Kind of a Martian moment, actually, is what it, is what it struck me yeah, as. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the guy who shows up and arrests him at the very end. Is that I think that's a robot. Wait. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, that's right. Uh, within whatever that crazy fantasy the, land the, is. The warden who shows up and yeah. pulls him back out. Yeah. Uh, I'm not overly worried about that. If he's smart enough to do everything he's done, he's smart enough to take two paper clips and figure out how to escape or whatever. I, I think we'll get something. Oh, like he's that. getting out of there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Where do you uh, think and looking glasses at now that he's had, uh, and, and this is another thing that, that Justin found agonizing that it was that the entire backstory was basically reduced to one YouTube video info dump. I didn't mind it because to me, that beat was less about explaining how we got to this crazy world and more about uh, explaining what the cavalry is up to. And as such, I, I thought it was fine. Uh, but I'm really interested. I like the way at the end they have Looking Glass clearly understanding everything's a fraud. And he takes the alarm system and throws it in the garbage. But then kind of walking back, he's like, yeah, but maybe it's not. <laughs> and then, like, it's it's sort of accurately convey, conveyed that he's a bit on the fence on this. 
Or I, I couldn't tell if it was that or if he just thought, well, there might be some parts in there I could use. That is actually what I thought. I'm like, hey, that's such a waste. And then he went back and got it. I'm like, yeah, you, you could probably use that to make something else. Uh, so it's got to be one of those, right? I I think uh, I'm with you that the Looking Glass uh, backstory was to me a way to to show how we got here uh, and to to be able to reveal that, yeah, no, that, that, that we, we, anybody who read the comic book knows where that squid came from. Come on, looking glass, get with the program. So it didn't bother me at all. Yep. I'm with you. All right. Uh, good place. Episodes seven and eight, uh, the trials, basically, uh, we, we started the trial in one episode and ended it in the other. Uh, I felt like the one where they faked all the funerals was a little bit, uh, filling time. Um, Although I, I did like the parts when we were in the trial and 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 you got to see Michael arguing uh, for you know against uh, the demons, but this most recent episode is the one that I really enjoyed because we finally got that good place moment where she says, "Okay, you win." And I'm like, "It's not going to be that easy." And the winning means we reset everything and destroy all existence of humans ever in the timeline. The uh, 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 we're talking about the episode that be, that ends with the cliffhanger, right? Of 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 him halfway through saying he's sorry. That's the first of the two. Yeah. Oh shoot! I did. Th- there's another one after it. I only watched the one. Yeah, Dang there was it. one on Thursday. Oh, damn it! Yeah, okay, yeah there's then. one every Thursday. Well, no, no, no. That that was the last one. Oh, mm-hmm. friggin' something. To look, this is what happens when we go two weeks off. I look, I look, and the way it's aligned, I go back, and then I go, and then and. and it doesn't matter. Whatever. Uh, uh, I, I agree with you, Tom, on the funeral stuff. That bit was, once they started doing it, I was like, why is this even, this is such a filler bit. And and it's it, it, it's it's a shame that those character moments that they have to like give everyone a character portrait moment in the exact same way feels so stretched out. I mean, uh, was it last season where they had everyone he either had an episode or an entire half an episode about going back and meeting their people in yes. their lives and going back to the origin story. Mm-hmm. And uh, last year that, that was a, a real slog for me. And I, I felt that in this episode. So but, uh, it certainly picked up in the episode that it sounds like Brian didn't get a chance to see. So. That's, that's fine. That's, but that, yeah. that's not the last episode of the entire series, right? We got, no, we there got no, so many. Definitely more. not. Okay. okay. Definitely not. <laughs> well, then so. I'll, I'll catch up on that. Yeah. We'll talk about more Good Place next week. Uh, Mr. Robot, uh, episode six and seven. Uh, Brian didn't get to see episode seven yet, so he's going to leave. He's going to leave. Uh, while Bryce and I talk about what's going on with uh, Elliot uh, basically being a monster. I have to agree. In episode six, he is a monster. Uh, mm-hmm. he, he does something unconscionable and unethical and justifies it because the ends justify the means, which is sort of what he's been fighting against throughout this entire series. Mm -hmm. And then it all gets turned out on his head when we see an even more monstrous person uh, rope him in and use his therapist against him and bringing out the truth about his father uh, in a way that, I don't know about you, Bryce, but Mm -hmm. I sat there thinking, Okay, the obvious answer is that his father sexually abused him. So I'm waiting for it to be right. something different than that. It's definitely and, the, the few minutes leading up to the revelation. You're like, are they going to say that his father molested him? Is that really going to be yeah. it? It's going to be his father abusing him would mm-hmm. be my thing. So it must be something different. Like it wasn't his father or his mm-hmm. father had multiple personalities or, and I guess the father mm-hmm. having multiple personalities still could come out. That could be the other shoe that drops here. I don't know, but right. uh, it, it, uh, it wasn't as big of a revelation as I expected it, it to be, even though mm-hmm. I love the rest of that episode leading up to the big revelation. It, it's a huge emotional scene, right? Like the performances are spot on. The I think the 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 play aesthetic of that entire episode uh, lands really well. Um, yeah. But I had the same thing. I had the same thing in the moment of like, is it really going to be this? You're definitely like teasing it like it's going to be this, and then it's this. Um, but going back and uh, seeing some other people, uh, some other discussions online about it and and seeing all of the little unexplained character moments of Elliot, especially as a kid, completely get recontextualized. Like the scene mm-hmm. with, uh, with, with his father dying in the movie theater, right? Like why would a kid just like watch his dad 
die and then go and sit in the movie. I like all he's mad about is that he didn't say, didn't tell anyone he had cancer. Well, Mm -hmm. no, but if he was also diddling him, then you would be like, Oh, oh, well, and especially if this is at the point where, because the other big revelation was that Mr. The Mr. Robot personality was already with Elliot by the time he had been pushed out of the window. Right. So, um, protecting him. Right. Right. So I, I think, I think it, it fills out more lore stuff than it seems to in the in the immediate moment, um, and it and it 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 it, it goes back and, and fills in um, some of those really kind of unexplained personality bits. Um, it it, it mm-hmm. makes me think that maybe the Mister Robot, or maybe the father that we see in some of those flashbacks, mm-hmm. is Mister Robot. Like when his oh. father is being kind to him. That's actually in flashbacks, a a a a, a memory uh, illusion as well. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. It, it it is it's the sort of thing. It's kind of similar to the the season one revelation of his father being one of his multiple personalities. That almost makes me want to go back and rewatch the the show yeah, for right. those moments because it's it, it 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 feels substantial in that way. That like the prison, the Elliot was actually in prison this whole time. Thing didn't feel as surprising. Mm-hmm. I want to, I want to go back to something I said, because mm-hmm. when I, when, before they revealed what it was that is, that he was afraid of with his father, yeah. uh, I was thinking about the line in a previous episode where we see his mother and himself as a child, uh, sort of in his mind palace mm-hmm. <laughs> saying, uh, he was saying something about another personality is coming. Right. This was uh, uh, earlier this season. This was a few episodes right. ago this season. Yeah. And uh, Mr. Robot, during the therapy session in this last episode, saying, you can't do this. I'm your last protection. Uh, this will get rid of me. You don't want to do this. I made me think, you. yeah, that mm-hmm. this other personality was going to come. And... My guess before the revelation was his father had multiple personalities. The Mr. Robot we know was when his father was being good, but there was another personality that was the evil father, and that personality also lives in Elliot. So an evil, an evil. Mr. So an Robot. evil Mr. Robot. Basically, that's interesting. There, there's been uh, some discussion I, I online thought... about like about weird stuff of like, well, when Mr. Robot is wearing a hat. That might be a different Mr. Robot than when he's not wearing a hat. Like that that's the level of granularity people are looking at this. Be. And I think that's a little yeah. too nitpicky. Uh I can I can see it being that. Uh, I I don't know who what else that third quote unquote third personality would be. Um I don't think it's us as the viewer because we don't have any bearing on the show. Uh, but we certainly seem to have been a presence uh so far. I I I I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm so fascinated by who, it could, I mean, the idea of an evil or I don't know, a, a sort of Mr. Hyde type personality coming out. Mr. Robot cool. and, Mr. and Dr. Robot and Mr. Hyde. <laughs> uh, it could also just be an evil, like an evil Elliot uh, mm. or not even an evil Elliot, Elliot just like a, a, a broken Elliot, right? Mm. The Elliot we know is the protected Elliot, right? He's walled off from his memories. That's why he's got the flat affect, that's why he does he does things the way he does. Maybe the real Elliot is the other personality, and that Elliot is more unpredictable and more dangerous. So suddenly, it's 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 another layer is revealed, and maybe the the real world Elliot is replaced with another actor, even, and then Rami Malek is the subconscious type of character. Yeah, yeah. That would be interesting. What what did you think about Hard the the previous episode also, episode 6 with the Darlene and um and Dom standoff being the big the big part of it? Uh, I mean, we didn't get the resolution of it this episode and that's right. really all I wondered is like, okay, they're not going to kill Darlene, so how are they not going to kill Darlene? Mm-hmm. And and it looks like from the previews we're going to pick up that conversation uh next week. Uh but yeah, I mean, that all was good stuff uh i didn't think dom was going to kill her but they definitely kept me on the edge of my seat for for most of that because dom doesn't have any choice there and so now it feels like well dom you're stupid you shouldn't have (laughs) taken so long to do this Mm -hmm. uh but i have a feeling it's not going to be that simple either yeah i kind of had part of me 
I, I, I like Dom as a character and I like Darlene as a character. Um, and, but part of me was like, if, if not, if this ends up with neither of them killing each other, we're, it feels like plot armor almost to like drag it all the way out to the end of the time limit and then come up with, you know, oh, she's deleting her phone. We need her alive now. Uh, and and it, it feels like an evasion in sort of storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, but her usefulness will still, you know, only take her so far, I think. Uh, Darlene, at least. Yeah. All right. Should we call Brian back in? Yeah. We can uh, talk about the Larry Sanders show, uh, the talk show episode, episode nine and party. Yeah. Episode 10. The talk show uh, episode was great. Well, it's funny too. Like both these episodes are kind of opposite types. The talk show episode dives deeper into the talk show where we actually see the talk show more than we might normally. Whereas the party episode all like dives deeper into his home life. And we see a lot more of, of what goes on at his house than we would normally. I think, I think we also see more of the characters in the party episode, right? Where it's like, we get, we get a deeper dive. Yeah. We, we get a little bit more of the pettiness of people. The ensemble it's, characters. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Right. Well, well we see, uh, we've seen sort of the top layer of people, but now we're sketching out the, them at their worst and most petty. Right. And I think that that's important to sort of draw a complete circle around each of them. I don't even know if it was worst and most petty, to be honest. It was just depth. <laughs> it was just, oh, here, here's what happens in an office environment. People wonder about the home life, especially of, of the boss. Uh, and, well, like, uh, and, and for, for example, we'll take, we'll take a uh, Rip Torn's character. We've, we've seen his top level, you know, uh, 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 uh -huh. super, uh, loyal, uh, uh, to a fault uh, or to the end to, to, to Larry. But then we find out the border on the bottom, you know, they've never You're hung talking out about together. the major characters and I'm talking about the, the ensemble characters. Yeah. yeah. We but do it, see, uh, of Larry, his wife and Rip, uh, we definitely see them in, in worse light than we have seen them usually with the, with the, the producers and assistants, it feels like, Oh, we actually just to get to see them more. Right. 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 Correct. They, they become more of real characters. Like we find out that there's a girl's club that they do. And then we find out that, that there's a little bit of jockeying for position and Janine Garofalo really wants to, you know, have, have ambitions or whatever. Um, the, uh, and and when when I say kind of the bottom edge, I don't necessarily mean them at their worst so much as just the limits of their relationship. Like there is, we mm -hmm. find out this episode that there is no relationship between Rip Torn and and Larry Sanders beyond the office. And uh, uh, and we also, man oh man, uh, with good intentions, uh, Larry's wife is trying to get everyone together, and boy, is 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 that a bad idea? Well, that that was the most uh, sitcom-y aspect of this, right? Like, she just wants to invite Artie over. That's it. But then, and in typical sitcom fashion, uh, the game of telephone ends up with everyone being invited over. Because how can you not? You don't want to offend anyone. Uh, and, and one hilarious hijink leads to another and they're all there. Uh, but I think it ended up working great because, because the party episode, the party part of the party episode, uh, is, is where all the, the, the sort of stuff that we're talking about, the important stuff that happens, happens. So, I mean, I guess, you know, because you've already, have, have either of you guys seen this? Bryce has seen this, yeah. right? No, it, I've never seen it before. It I've seen it all. really looks like they're headed for like a trial separation or something. It looks like they're. Marriage is going to be <laughs> Bryce. Bryce is bouncing in his seat right now. <laughs> I mean, there's there are there are a bits of Gary Shandling in L the Larry Sanders character, and I think that comes through uh, as we get further along in the show. Is what I'll say to that. Right on. Uh, I actually do I, have three seasons, four seasons. Sorry, four, five seasons, five six seasons. seasons. Right. Wow. I I I. I, I really thought that the talk show episode was was really cool because it felt like some of the first episodes had like it would start with the opening monologue, right, of the Larry mm -hmm. Sanders show. And this one felt like we were seeing the whole show, right? Like uh, you actually saw the interviews with Billy Crystal and Catherine O'Hara, um, as well as like all the little behind the scenes things. It, it felt 
it, it felt really cool for that sort of change in format. It it also this it, these two episodes felt a bit like a precursor to Curb Your Enthusiasm, where mm. where they were generally unpleasant. I did not have a good time with how awkward everything felt, and that that awkwardness comedy I don't think was really prevalent in the early nineties. Mm. Yeah, I guess not. Catherine O'Hara, Catherine O'Hara's bits were so good when after her interview and he was like, okay, I got to go. I only have like 90 seconds. I got to go. And she's like, you got this, you got, and she just keeps bringing him back and talking to him. Like it's so, it's such an undersold moment, but it's so, it's such a good bit. Well, and also the bit where she just kind of interrupts them Mm -hmm. and refuses to take the hint that he's talking, that he's arguing with his wife until she finally gets it and sort of backs out. And as she's walking away, you hear her scream. (laughs) (laughs) Oh man. And then we also did see more like some of what we saw in the party episode of, you know, the support staff kind of rounding those characters out. We see the beginning of it with all of them kind of ganging up on Larry's wife, uh, trying Mm. to convince her to like, you know, stay and stick around and listen to him. Uh, that's, it's, it's, this is where we start to see more and more of those characters sort of build out. Yeah. And that, that's where it does start to really feel like curb. You're right, Brian. All right, anything else on the Larry Sanders show? Uh, no, it, uh, Rip Torn is increasingly the best part of the entire show. Artie, forever. All right, thanks, folks, for watching. Thanks for listening. Thanks for supporting at patreon.com slash cordkillers, and we will spoil you again next week. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>